Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. This is special for us because it's the 155th anniversary of the birth of Elizabeth Craig Coolidge tonight. So every year on this occasion, we have a Founders Day concert honoring her and the fact that she founded our series. It's also the 75th anniversary of the premiere of Appalachian Spring. So it's just kind of a memorable night and we're so glad to share it with these very distinguished artists. From my left, Avi Stein, director, harpsichordist and organist, yes. uh, associate um, organist and chorus master at Trinity Wall Street, uh, and Robert Mealy, violinist who is uh, probably well known to some of you, um, director of this, co-director of this ensemble, and director of the very impressive Juilliard 415 historically informed performance practice um, program there, and my new colleague, Kazim Abdullah. Welcome. <laughs> so I wanted to say that Quicksilver, as you'll hear tonight, brings together a group of the very top North American historically informed performers. Um, the quotes that you read about them say things like, revered like rock stars within the early music scene, and things like this. They are known for a mastery of performance practice and scholarship and inventive programs also a command of particularly 17th century music, like the imaginative program that we're gonna be hearing tonight. So we'd like to talk with you about how you came to develop this music as a major part of your core repertoire. What, what drew you to it and how long have you been doing it? Um, I, th I think one of the special things about uh, this group is that we, we've all known each other for a long time. We've all worked together in very different situations over the course of, um, uh, a large part of our careers, and it's been, we've always enjoyed each other's musical company in these various contexts, and so it seemed really a wonderful occasion to bring, to come together, because we all share this interest in this particular repertory, which is, um, I think, exciting for us, because it offers the possibility of a lot of spontaneity and improvisation. Um, it's music that, what's also interesting is this music that doesn't um, immediately, uh, it's, when you read it for the first time, you think, hmm. <laughs> and often we're, we're not entirely sure that um, what is there actually, that whether, it's, whether it's fabulous or whether it's um, what could be made of it. And gradually, it's, it's an interesting process to see it coming to life over the course of rehearsal as well. Yeah. It's so, this, this music is so dramatic, sometimes you're not expecting that, you know, you're thinking of almost stayed, you think North German music might be stayed, and this is music between Schutz and Bach, right? Um, and I know there's a North German style and a South German style, what, which is on your program tonight? Well, we have a bit of both, and... Uh, the, the title of the program tonight having to do with Bach's library, the idea um, is that Bach is obviously, uh, for many people, the big name that culminates what we, what we call these days the Baroque era, but uh, he, he himself was very much influenced by the composers that came before him. In fact, we have a lot of information about which composers specifically we're talking about. Often we talk about oh, this is sort of the context in which anybody grew up, but with Bach, we actually specifically know which pieces he copied and which composers he was influenced by. And the program tonight is a mixture of either pieces that he specifically had in his library um, or composers that, uh, whose works were in the library or composers that we knew that he was uh, influenced by. Um, I think, for me, the, the idea of coming up with this program has to do with a particular quote I remember reading uh, years ago um, about Frank Lloyd Wright who said uh, when uh, the story goes that when he found out that Bach had copied the works of Vivaldi and others in order to, to learn how to do this music, he said, oh, now I know that my genius is unique. I never had to stand on anyone else's shoulders, <laughs> which uh, any architectural student will um, take great issue with that particular one. But, uh, uh, but I think certainly uh, the truth with Bach is that uh, as uh, as innovative that he was in many aspects, the idea is really that he was a culmination of, of so many different things. And so, uh, back to the idea of whether it's North German or South German, uh, one per thing that's particularly interesting about uh, the 17th and the 18th century for that matter is how cosmopolitan the world was back then um, 
in ways that uh, might surprise us. You know, these days with globalization and instant communication, we think that anything back in the day when it took so long to physically get from one place to the other, that things were much more insular. And in some ways, of course, they were. But, uh, but so much of this music, um, and, and the German music that we're talking about specifically, uh, is heavily influenced by music from Italy and from France. Tonight, we're, we're talking mostly about Italian music, um, but, uh, but certainly with Bach, there's a heavy French influence as well. I was looking at some of the Italian journeys that these musicians made, and you don't realize that people, as you say, traveled actually quite long distances. And uh, was it R Rosenmuller who went to St. Mark's in yes. Venice? So, somewhat unintentionally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's um, the yeah. one. You tell yeah, that. no, it's, it's a very interesting story. Um, Rosenmuller, a remarkable composer, we're playing two pieces by him on the program tonight. Um, should be much better known, particularly for these amazing late instrumental works that we're doing. Um, he was he was in Leipzig. He was actually in line to become the Thomas Cantor. He would have been two generations before Bach. So we're talking sort of 1670s. Um, and he gets caught up in this terrible scandal. He is accused of sleeping with um, some of the choir students, male, and he gets arrested for um, suspicion of homosexuality, which was obviously at that point a, a severe penalty. Uh, he would have been basically imprisoned for, um, quite possibly for life. He escapes, he flees to Italy, as one does, um, <laughs> and ends up in um, ends up in Venice, and it's, it's kind of amazing because he ends up uh, doing the same job that Vivaldi was to do about a century later um, as the music teacher for the, the women in the Ospedale of uh, the Pietà. And he also ends up as being one of the musicians at San Marco. And so his music is this amazing combination of German counterpoint and everyone in the, uh, there are a lot of German theorists from the 18th century who point to his music and say this is really particularly fine craftsmanship. Johann Matheson, when he's um, in his great book about how to compose and how to write music, he quotes uh, one of the uh, fugues from the sonatas and he says, this is so well written, I can only tell you, go thou and go and do likewise. <laughs> um, but then he has this amazing mix of uh, Italian operatic laments that turn in there that, that are part of the, the story as well. So it's this incredibly cosmopolitan musical language that he creates in his late sonatas. Uh, very, very interesting composer. Wow. So you are both very interested in teaching and mentoring people, especially in regards to early music. and. Uh, um, I was particularly interested in your comment. I read that um, you said uh, Baroque as a second language <laughs> yeah. and one yeah. that should be studied and spoken fluently by all students and players. So like, I, I was wondering if, if you could both sort of talk about maybe your philosophy in regards to Baroque music. And yeah, it, it seems like it's having a renaissance in the United States and how it was back when you were studying and how it is today. Absolutely, yeah. Um, one of the cool things that's happening now is that um, I think students find the idea of doing historical performance as something that's really liberating. Um, it is so much about gesture and about um, making a compelling case for whatever phrase you're committed to, uh, that it can apply the same kind of mentality, the same kind of approach to music. It's also often very similar to what you find in contemporary music, for example, mm -hmm. um, this real commitment to gesture. So it's, it's fantastic to give students the opportunity to explore this music. It's also great that it, um, we're finding now that uh, the modern faculty really embraces it now, and which has not been true in the past. So it feels like it's kind of after the revolution in that way. Um, and yeah, this class that I teach at Juilliard is called Baroque as a Second Language, or BSL. Um, and it's, um, it's the idea is to give modern players, uh, I, I give them Baroque bows, and they use their modern instruments so they don't have to get freaked out by a different pitch or by uh, a broke violin that may not work so well if it's not very well made. Um, they have great instruments, they just use this very new tool of the bow. And it's, it really is like learning a new language for them. And it's, it's I think, I find it incredibly liberating for them to, to do. Um, I think uh, the idea of learning a style that, in a sense, is resurrected, it's a style that we think people played and sang in two, three hundred, four years, four hundred years ago, whatever, um, 
and we're somehow reinventing it um, makes it seem, the whole concept of style in a, in a sense seems obscure and somewhat remote, but if you think um, that people perform musical theater versus classical music versus jazz versus folk music, that we're very, we're very um, aware of the styles of any of those particular things and, and, and it's especially obvious when a performer tries to do something that they're not necessarily uh, comfortable with. If anybody has heard recordings of classical people doing, uh, doing um, musical theater or pop music, you can say you know, it's, it's quite obvious that that person has more or less uh, experience in the style. Um, and yet when we get to classical music, the idea that that uh, music written in the 1950s should, should sound somewhat differently than music written in the 1880s and then music written in the 1780s and all the way back, the idea that there should be a, a specific style for each one of those all of a sudden becomes a very different idea. So, so for us, uh, the idea, again, is that people 400 years ago did not play and sing in the same way that they do now, and perhaps there's some clue from either how they talk about the music or the instruments that they played, or just the music itself that gives us some clue in terms of, of what makes this music work best. You know, I was thinking about, uh, you made a comment that I read about you guys are ethnomusicologists investigating the past, and not only the musical history, but the cultural history, which is kind of, and you, I'm sure you teach your students, you teach it at Yale and Juilliard too, right? Uh, at Juilliard, yeah. Yeah, I used to teach, used Yale. To teach Yale. <laughs> so um, you're really, you're detectives, as it were, and I was thinking about what you just said, um, thinking about some of the early music legends that have been at the library, and this is something that I think Sue was going to mention in her talk tonight, but when you listen to the recordings of, say, Alfred Deller singing in the Coolidge, or Safford Cape, uh, David Munro, early musicians, you know, sure. uh, fame Noah Greenberg and all these people, it's kind of amazing because you you do, it's like watching an old movie with the almost exaggerated articulation, sometimes in the 30s, you know, that we don't speak that way anymore. But yet, it doesn't matter somehow the greater the artists, just each one has a unique style. So um, if you want to, how do you impart this? How do you teach people how to communicate? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, one of my favorite quotes is the beginning of a novel by L.P. Hartley where he, it starts, um, the past is a different country. Is it, the past <laughs> is a foreign country. Yeah. They do things differently there. Um, so part of it is just acknowledging that it is different. Um, uh, we, uh, the students we're working with, um, it's, trying to get them to, um, to, to, in a way, question a lot of the, their assumptions about how music is naturally delivered, whether that's like, you'll always have a permanent vibrato going on for string players. It's funny mm -hmm. because these, these sort of questions of, um, and they're really questions of taste or aesthetics, um, but they're, and they're very, they're very period specific, they're very culturally specific. So for example, like in the modern world, um, you know, string instruments tend to have a great deal of vibrato. Um, in the woodwinds, flutes have a certain amount of vibrato, oboes have a bit, clarinets have almost no vibrato. Is that true to say? No, that's yeah. Not true. Not so it's this weird, um, hmm. like, the aesthetic could be quite different depending on what instrument you're using. So just as, as one aspect, you know, the possibility of exploring uh, the possibilities of expression with the right hand, with the bow. Mm -hmm as opposed to the automatic in expression of the left hand, that a lot of this becomes about, and again, using the tools of the time, using a, a Baroque bow, you're, you're really speaking suddenly, rather than giving a huge long legato line, you're actually, it's like, I often say it's like driving a small sports car instead of a big plush Cadillac, that you're, it's kind of nimble, you're in control of the road a lot more, you can, hmm. um, you can do sharp turns and a lot of interesting <laughs> Swerves. Sharp turns. Yeah. <laughs> Swerves. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know, it was last week or a couple weeks ago, we had Yeston Davis here with the group Fretwork, and he was, uh, Davis had written this thing about how working with Fretwork had changed, at least for their partnership, the way that he articulated, the way that he himself conceived the sung sound, and he referenced the way they all sound together in a certain kind of a space. And uh, we were talking about that, and he said the way that the viol is bowed is, of course, so different than what we do today, but he found that he had literally changed his style uh, somewhat in that regard. Um, I have a question for all three of you. 
And that is, now that you've all been teaching and working a, a lot with young students, and there is a massive wave of interest in early music, I think. Don't you feel it's flourishing in the U.S.? And also, what about Germany? Because Kazima has just spent a lot of time as a conductor in Germany. Well, in my opinion, it seems, yeah, you know, like I, I feel like I... So um, I first went to Germany around 2010, and I feel like I left and I came back to see what about a new musical landscape. There's so many uh, new early music groups that have been formed and things mm -hmm. like this, and I, I think a big reason for that is due to the teaching that's, that's going on in places like Juilliard and, and Yale and uh, some other I I institutions in this country. But um, yeah, like it seems like it's really it's flourishing. A, yeah, it's, it's a new landscape in the last, and I do think your program there has a, a great deal to do with it. And both of you, uh, I should say that um, you are the artistic director of the Helicon Foundation series, and Robert also is strongly associated with, or you're the orchestra director for the Boston Early Musical Music Festival, so these are people that really have made an enormous contribution to this wave of interest. So what are, what's your perspective on this with students and young people? Well, I think part of it has to do perhaps with a kind of decentralization in culture these days um, where uh, the orchestra doesn't reign supreme or the orchestra in the opera house doesn't reign supreme in the way that it did um, maybe up to the 70s, I guess, maybe. And, uh, and now, well, unfortunately, a lot of students who go through, through colleges or through conservatories, um, they aren't guaranteed the kind of orchestra jobs that they were before. And so they have to have a wider set of skills in order to make it out in the workplace. Um, the, you know, we talk about the freelance economy, the gig economy, and this doesn't apply to music only, but of course the terminology is right there in music. Um, so I think it certainly is useful for students to be able to do a little bit of everything. Um, on the other hand, I think as, as teachers, we try also to make sure that they take it that they take it seriously, and that the jack of all trades, master of none title doesn't apply to students, which is of course difficult. Um, but I think there is also just an interest in wider things that these basic channels uh, that that we have been used to for either education or employment have eroded, um, and so. Uh, so I think that's uh, one of the reasons why early music uh, has come up. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, there's also the, the appeal of the repertory is very strong for a lot of, um, a lot of young musicians. It's, it's, a, it's a place where they can explore issues of improvisation and, and spontaneity, as I was saying. Um, but as Avi says, one of our, I think, something we all feel very strongly as, as teachers of this, like I, I do a this BSL class, which is a great introduction for um, sort of blowing the minds in a very small way of modern players who've never thought about this before and really find it incredibly liberating. But then actually to, it's like the difference between being able to um, manage to order something off of a menu in a foreign country as opposed to actually being able to carry on a conversation yes. and be persuasive in a different language. So it really is a matter of, of learning learning this, this culture, learning this speech as fluently as possible and as persuasively as possible, that's part of it. And in the opera world, because you've been involved in this very strongly for a long time, when you were in Germany, what, what, is, the feel, what is the scene there um, in terms of early music performance practice in the orchestra pit? Did you work with that? As well, I was very fortunate that in Aachen we had access to early in instruments, so uh, we had a collection of Baroque violins and Baroque violins mm. and things like this. Nice. So we did a handle opera sort of every year, and we also did um, some, um, yeah, we did sort of smaller scale projects, but um, yeah, a lot more sort of even professional orchestras that um, used to not really pay attention so much to early music. That's what I was wondering. Pay attention now yeah. about how performance practice should be when one is playing Bach mm -hmm. and Handel and Monteverdi and yeah. And as a conductor, you have to really learn this language yourself, even if you didn't before, just like we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, so, would you mind to talk about maybe some future projects that you have? Um, yeah. I, oh, yeah. Like when we were uh, trying to see like what kinds of 
programs you had on Augur, you had one program that was called the first VME School. Oh. And I thought that was the very sure first VME School. <laughs> yeah, the very first VME School. Would you mind just to say like a little bit about that? Because it was oh, also sure, yeah, a yeah. very fascinating yeah. program and we thought about it. Oh, great, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it yeah it's actually going to be our um, next CD, which is um, the idea being, of course, there's the, you, we usually think now of the second VME School with Schoenberg and Weber and then the first VME School being Mozart Haydn. But in fact, there was a, some amazing stuff happening in Vienna around the 17th century that, um, again, it's this moment, Vienna is so close to Italy that for a long time the Kapellmeister in, Meisters in Vienna were Italian. Um, so there was tremendous influence there already. And we're finding that also there's, it's a, it's a really interesting moment in that it's, uh, we tend to sort of think of this generally as being Baroque music in a way, which is not a very good, catch-all term because it covers everything from 1600 to 1760 or so. But this moment right around the, in the 17th century, which in a way is much more mannerist than um, anything, they're, it's very experimental. They're trying a bunch of very strange, interesting things. Um, the Germans are trying to figure out how this, how this machine works, um, how this aesthetic works. And they, they themselves bring a, a tremendous, um, their own particular flavors to it. There's a real South German melancholy that is often part of this. Actually, you'll hear some of that tonight in pieces like Rosenberger. Um, and tremendous um, imagination and inventiveness with the solos that are sort of in, that are in the middle of these pieces. So, yeah, it's very cool repertory. Yeah. Yeah. Who were some of the major composers? Uh, Bertali is one of them. The, um, yeah, our, um, my co-director, Julie Andrzejewski, actually one of her doctoral projects was figuring out um, Bertali became such a, at the, in his time, he was a, such a major figure that uh, a ton of works were attributed to him because that carried more cachet. And she has been trying to figure out who actually wrote those pieces that weren't Bertali. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a really interesting question of just like, what counts as a composer's style yeah. at that point? Yeah. So, actually, just to yeah. go on with the idea of experimental mannerist music from this time. We have one composer on tonight's program, uh, Matthias Weckmann, mm. who I think is probably the weirdest composer mm. overall for the 17th century. And um, you'll see they're really, really fantastic, fantastic and fantastical pieces uh, that he writes. And he's, he's also kind of an emblem for this particular age because he starts off in the eastern part of Germany, in Dresden, in, in a part of Germany that, that was heavily um, that was heavily uh, decimated, actually, by, by the Thirty Years' War. And he ends up uh, moving over to Hamburg in order to escape this. But I think this melancholy that Robert mentions um, in, in those works comes up in this, uh, the chaos and the melancholy of this really, uh, uh, this really catastrophic event in the, in the early part of the 17th century has a huge effect on music. And it also has a huge effect on the aesthetics even later. So I think when you, when you go through Bach cantatas and this very deep melancholy that, that shows up and also strange, strange sense of Lutheranism, which I think is hard for us these days to relate to in some ways when, when at the last movement of, for example, cantata 82, he says, I rejoice in my own death, which I think is rather hard for us these days. But I think this idea that the world is so difficult um, and, and you have this afterlife to look for and this extreme piety in the face of all the difficulties in the world, that's something that certainly comes out of the chaos that ravaged uh, Central Europe. And I think this, uh, both the melancholy and the sort of, um, the, the explosion in style, um, the really, really weird part of Weckmann, I think that's something that comes out of this, uh, this uh, aesthetic and the political and social situation of, of the early 17th century. I was thinking oh. about this name, this, the name of your ensemble, Quicksilver and the mercurial aspects of so much of this music that you're going to be performing tonight and you have to be um, adept in these stylistic shifts and expressive shifts and so on. And I was wanting to ask you if you would comment on this uh, Stilus Fantasticus or so, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's um, the, the word that they describe, a, a lot of this music is described as, um, by the theorists of the time as being in this fantastic style, which uh, the theorists say is the kind of style where basically anything goes, you can do whatever you want. So it's only governed by the range of your imagination. 
they, they themselves were really conscious of this being new music, and I think that's really interesting, that a lot of the publications, especially in the early part of the 17th century, are called Stile Moderno or um, Nuove Musiche. So it's, it's like, that was old, this is new, and this, it, it's, they're very sort of consciously avant-garde, you know, which is interesting. Um, I also think one, one thing that's helpful to think about this with is when historians talk about this period, they call it, it's, it's known as the early modern. And I think that's a very cool term in that it's modern in the sense of being new and something that we can totally relate to is, um, as this, this the, the continuing catastrophe of daily life goes on. Um, but also early in a way that's completely uh, foreign to us, completely far from us. So it's this very interesting combination of being one of the things that I find most telling about this music is that it's, for all its avant-gardeness and strangeness, it's extraordinarily accessible. Um, it dances, it sings, it speaks passionately. So that's, um, I think that's kind of the takeaway because it's very easy to make it sound um, esoteric and like with all new music. <laughs> well, speaking of new music, do you ever actually play contemporary music? Or um, we we haven't as an ensemble yet, although um, there's been talk of various composers writing for us. Yeah. So, um, but the actually uh, at Juilliard, our, um, Juilliard 415, the the chamber on the orchestra of the historical performance program. We've been doing a lot of new music recently. We did an amazing project last year of the Haydn Seven Last Words quartets, and we commissioned seven composers to write responses to those. Four period instruments, um, and that was that was fascinating. Is that the one with the crossing? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, we did. That was actually a Quicksilver project we did with the crossing as well. So, but a similar thing where we played Buxtehude, and mm. there were um, composers who wrote meditations on these Buxtehude pieces. Um, so I think that can be an incredibly fertile ground of of responses to oh, this yeah. music. Yeah. But also in, in the sense of discovery, the idea of doing new music because especially the 17th century, so much of this repertoire is not particularly well known either to audiences or to performers for that matter, uh, that we often find pieces that haven't been done before or have rarely been done before. And so for us, uh, things can feel like world premieres, um, even though uh, it's not technically, but I would say if something hasn't been done in 300 years, it's <laughs> practically the equivalent. <laughs> and, and thinking of that, when I looked at your program, I was so fascinated. And, you know, first this mental snapshot of a giant cupboard with leather-bound volumes that belong to, you know, that was my, 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 my image. But I was looking at the program and thinking, hmm, these are pieces that have never been performed at the library before. Yeah. So for us, they are premieres, and we're oh, very that's excited great. about that's them. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. And actually just one thing about this program in terms of accessibility is that um, at least from a marketing standpoint, it's if you say, oh, we're doing music by Rosenmuller and Schmelzer and Weckmann, it's, <laughs> you're not going to get an audience, much less a presenter to give. And so, but it's cool, it's great. Well, and that's, and that's actually one of the things that I think is so nice in this case is that you've got, you, you can throw on a composer like Bach and everybody says, oh, I get that, but there isn't Bach on this program, but then once you come here, I promise you that, that you will come away thinking there's nothing obscure about this repertoire, um, at least not from an experiential standpoint. And their textures and this, you know, the melody, you'll just be stunned. I mean, it's music that, as I say, I'm not uh, familiar with at all, but it's, it's beautiful. And the organ is so lovely in this repertoire. Um, so you, you're, you're thinking, I, I had a question for you, Kazim. Have you heard of, the, when you were in Germany, were these composers played there? Not to my <laughs> That's I, what I wondered. No, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I had never heard of Rosen, Mueller, and Beckmann, actually. They, those are the two composers that were new for me. And yeah. so, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, you know, that's why one comes to the Library of Congress to <laughs> discover <laughs> these sorts of gems. Thanks, to thanks. Bring artists up before yeah, them. Yeah, so exactly. It should be a very exciting program. So what, um, back, back quickly, or well, maybe we should ask, open this up. Why don't you guys ask some questions? Uh, if you have some, and if not, we can we can move forward. While we're getting the, oh, the microphone, yeah, there's one already then. Um, you talked about waves of historical informed performance, mm -hmm. and uh, as I attend the library over years, you're, you're now younger musicians. Uh, I 
uh, studied at the time of Alan Curtis and, oh, yeah. and, and Bill Christie yeah. were starting the historical. So it's not, a, it's not a new wave over the last 20 or 25 years. It goes back almost 50 years, mm -hmm. years now. So I wanted to ask, I guess, the two people who are, uh, I wanted to ask you, did you have an American mentor or did you go to mm -hmm. Europe and uh, That's a good question. Learn, yeah. learn from someone in, in Europe? That's a very good question. Um, I actually grew up in the Bay Area in uh, Berkeley, and in fact, I uh, basically um, cut class in high school to go play with mm -hmm. Alan Curtis's Collegium at UC Berkeley. So mm -hmm. that was one of my one of my first mentors was actually playing with Alan, uh, who's a remarkable. He was a musicologist who had this amazing second or maybe even third act in his career, where he started uh, his his whole thing was actually doing operas in the original place they were done, which is an amazing thing to do. So there were a couple of years where I was playing ne Neapolitan operas in San Carlo in Naples and Venetian operas in Venice, which was amazing. And I thought, oh, it's always going to be like this. And of course it wasn't, but it was great. Um, but he, yeah, he was am amazingly influential in, particularly since he was, it was so much about um, the rhetoric and the gesture involved in the music. One of the things for us now is that, uh, because of the nature of, uh, for example, the recording industry now, it's, uh, students don't necessarily know this history because people don't collect records or even CDs. It's uh, sort of, I heard something on Spotify once. Um, so we actually have a class, um, a semester at, at, in our program of the history of early music, just giving people, uh, putting themselves into the story, which I think is really important. Uh, Robert, actually, you have a quote that I really love, which is that we've been doing this music no longer than they have. Um, which is, if you think, you know, if you think about any specific style back then, if you think about oh, 18th century French music, it, uh, the style applies to let's say 1700 to 1740 or so, and then it goes. So we're talking about you know a generation or so, but at this point we're talking about a generation and a half, if not longer, that has been doing this. And so we can invent whether our style has anything to do with theirs is a different <laughs> story. Um, um, but uh, as you say, things are cyclical and they develop and, and it's interesting that way. My, in terms of my own education, I, I started um, as an organist. I picked up harpsichord later, but I was an undergrad at Eastman in Rochester and the organ practice rooms were this hallway where um, at, to get to that hallway, you had to walk past the office where Paul Odette, the lute player, had his uh, early music ensemble. And um, and after a year, I was uh, I was a freshman, and and I, I love I still am an organist, obviously, and I love it. But I, I thought, well, it's rather lonely being in the practice room all day. And then I, I'd walk past the early music room, and there were a dozen people or so having a great time in there. And and so I walked up to Paul and Crystal Thielman, his wife, and I said, well, how do I do this? And they said, well, you have to learn how to play continuo, how to play figured bass. And so I took I took a class, um, and and then my my. I guess, yeah, second semester of freshman year, I started playing in the early music ensemble there. Um, so Paul was certainly a huge mentor for me uh, at the beginning, and then after undergrad, I went and studied in France for a year and then came back. And you, um, you actually took your ensemble to Versailles, did you not? We did, we, yep. Recently, yep. a few um, years In fact, ago. Avi was conducting, we just did uh, Dido um, with Juilliard 415 and um, a lot of the soloists from the vocal arts program there. And Avi was the conductor, which was it. It was, and it was fantastic. Uh, speaking of things that you think will always be that way, I'll say when we uh, finished the first program and we walked downstairs and they gave us champagne and opened up the back, the, the doors to the backyard and the sunset was reflecting <laughs> off the palace and there were fireworks going off on yeah. the other side. And I said, well, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> exactly. That's pretty amazing there. Any other questions? I have a question about music owned by a Bach, um, which is the, the famous story about when Sebastian was living with his brother and there was a locked cabinet with some piece of music he wanted to copy and he s somehow got it out of the cabinet and copied it, and, but got in trouble, I believe. Um, the question is, is that a true story? And if it's a true story, what was the manuscript? My own theory is the more interesting the story, the less likely it is to be true. <laughs> um, 
Uh, other than that, I'm not, I, I'm not sure about the veracity of these things. Um, we certainly know that, uh, that his older brother uh, had a great deal of influence on him, and we have uh, two very specific uh, manuscripts that have to do with his early studies, mostly having to do with keyboard music, although sometimes they're keyboard transcriptions of orchestral music. Um, uh, a lot of uh, composers like Buxtehude and, uh, and earlier German composers, but also as well Lully, uh, foreign composers like that, um, uh, that uh, these, these, uh, these manuscripts, and that, and that gives us a lot of uh, information about how he started off. Um, and, uh, but they're mostly keyboard, those particular uh, collections are mostly keyboard music, so for this particular concert we're talking about later collections that he amassed uh, later in his life. <laughs> But I think it is important to remember that it's, it's so hard for us to imagine now that just the spread of information is really difficult. Like, in order to find a piece, you do, whether it's by moonlight without your brother's permission or not, you're still mm -hmm. having to copy it. Um, you, have to have, you have to have it somehow, and you have to have a chance to copy it. Um, a lot of what we're doing tonight, um, I think about half of it is from manuscript, is that true? Originally, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, so some of it was published that you could get it in um, if you went to the Nuremberg Book, Book Fair or the Leipzig um, f Market. You could you could find you could you could pick up this music, but otherwise it would only be if you knew a colleague who had a manuscript that you wanted to copy. So mm -hmm. just this dissemination is 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 very very different now. And in terms of thinking about how much music there could have been back then, the, the estimate that I'd heard that of, for example, the 200 or so sacred cantatas that we have by Bach, the assumption based on circumstantial evidence uh, is that there's at least that many cantatas that he wrote that do not survive. Yep. And for um, just his curtain period, when he's writing the Brandenburg concertos and a lot of his secular music, uh, based on the bookbinding records, Christoph Wolf thinks that we're lose, we've lost like at least 250 to 300 sonatas and concertos and trio sonatas. Mm. So. Yeah. And trio sonatas being probably the most populous, the most prolific uh, genre in the early 18th century, and the one which would apply to this particular group, when you think about it, there aren't really any... There are very few, let's say, trio sonatas by Bach. We've got the five, or sorry, the six for organ, which sometimes get transcribed, but they're not really, they're, they are actual organ pieces. There's the musical offering, and then there's a couple of others that are sort of on and off, and transcription, the gamba sonata, things like that. But when you consider how, uh, what percentage of a composer's output would have been trio sonatas, we should have, we should have 50 of them by Bach? Dozens, I would, uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And there Great. Okay. Lost how? I mean, not it's kind of amazing that things survive at all, dinner. frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, for a, it depends on the repertory. Um, as Avi said, it's this was music that was not only considered new, but it very rapidly became music that was considered old. And um, unlike now, where we have interest in music of the past. Back then, you only played new music, right? Which is an important thing to remember. You only, you probably only play stuff from your region. It's like um, terroir. It's like you drink the wine, you eat the cheese, you eat the bread that's made there, and you play the music from your region. Um, occasionally, other stuff filters in with musicians who bring stuff in or uh, publications that reach you. But it's very localized. Um, and you only do stuff that is current. Um, so... Last generation's music, even if it's by that funny guy named Bach, who was kind of weird, a little complicated, no one quite got him, not so interesting. So that stuff disappears very, 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 very quickly. I mean, in the 17th century, we have, um, for Monteverdi, we have uh, those two great late operas. We have Popea and we have Ulisse. We don't have his biggest hit, which was Ariana. We only have one piece from that. And of the three late operas, we have Ulisse and we have Popea, and we we only have a libretto for the third, which must have been as great as the others. But And we're lucky to have Ulysses at all because it only survives in a single manuscript that has nothing to do with him probably 30, 40 years after his death. 
in, uh, from Vienna. And so in terms of whether something survives or not, one big question is it's just a matter of statistics. So that is, if something was published, uh, it would have had dozens of copies printed. And so the chance that one of those, at least one of those, survives is certainly much better than if it was written in manuscript. And for Bach, specifically, out of all his pieces, very, very few of them were published. Um, mostly keyboard music, mm -hmm. uh, two cantatas are published, mm -hmm. is that right? I forget, but certainly less than half a dozen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, none of the orchestral works are published. Um, the, the great violin and cello pieces, they're not published, they're in manuscript, and so the fact that these things survive in the first place when there was a single copy made um, is really, really lucky. For Bach in, for Bach's, uh, particular, um, the fact that he was a, a teacher with a big following, he didn't have a great concert going following, but he had uh, students later in his life who followed him, students like Kernberger um, and uh, Agricola who are, who are big fans, and so we have things in there uh, in their um, handwriting. Um, and, and sometimes it's just sheer luck. So for example, we know for Bach that a lot of his manuscripts ended up in the hands of his two sons, uh, Carl Philipp Emanuel and Wilhelm Friedemann. And Carl Philipp uh, Emanuel was fairly stable personality and so everything survived much better. Whereas Wilhelm Friedemann, um, I don't know whether the, the the weight of being a, a firstborn, the, the eldest child of, of, of Johann Sebastian was too much uh, for him or whether it was just a matter of his personality, but he didn't do too well and so he ended up selling some of these manuscripts and breaking them apart in order to, in order to make uh, some money later when he, was, when he needed it. And so uh, for Carl Philipp Emanuel, everything stayed together and somehow survived, including surviving the Second World War, um, whereas Wilhelm Friedemann, as the things get uh, broken off and sold, the likelihood that each one of those things survives is, is less. So it's just random luck sometimes. We have two, two of the cantata manuscripts here. We're very lucky to have them, and we're going to have them on display later this year. But what you're saying is so amazing because even the money that he received, uh, Willem Friedemann, was so low. Uh -huh. he, he got a better quote, and then he, I think the total amount was like 50 ducats or something for the whole, whole amount. But anyway, um, I was going to say that um, uh, Masaki Suzuki, um, had said, I'm sorry, I'm getting his name wrong, the harpsichordist, he was saying to us that what's really exciting is to see the parts and that parts can convey so much of the knowledge of what you need as an artist to, to develop what uh, Bach had in mind. But the scores themselves actually were, were less interesting and that may have been another reason why they may not have made it into the, you know, into our hands today, which was interesting. I never thought about that. You think of parts as being excuse me, reproducible, that they're easily findable and reproducible. But with markings at the time, apparently they are just like gold. Fascinating. So maybe a couple more questions. I was curious, Avi, earlier on you mentioned that the way the people of the era themselves wrote about music has informed the way you play it today. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what kinds of documents you're talking about, diaries or letters to students or things written by the composers or the sure, players um, themselves. And also what uh, some examples of the insights that you've, you've gleaned. Oh, sure. Um, well, um, the... Actually, there is there's a nice uh, on your way to the um, to the concert tonight. Uh, on right before the door, when you look to the right, there are uh, first editions of works by three early 18th century French composers: Danglebert, Couperin, and oh, there's also a Fischer, a German Fischer, composer. Yeah. Um, and the, and you will see in the Couperin, for example, it's open to the table of ornaments. So when you have these little symbols little squiggles uh, above the notes that it's a trill, a mordant, little ornaments, um, and it doesn't tell you what the notes are. You have to know what the secret code is to do that. Well, this, this sort of index, in a way, the, um, this dictionary uh, explains uh, a cross means you twiddle five times in a row or anything like that, and you, and it, you can see it right there. So um, instruction books, uh, give us a great deal, and sometimes it can be very specific, again, in terms of a trill means play these specific notes, and sometimes uh, they talk in more general terms about style. Um, one really, uh, just because we've been talking about this, this time period, uh, one really useful uh, book is a book by a, a man named Georg Mufat, who is a German composer from Vienna around this time, very end of the 
end of the 17th, beginning of the 18th century, and he writes a book because, specifically because he goes to study both in Italy and in France, and he comes back to Germany and he says, this is how they do it over there, let me tell you. And so for us, that's very interesting because uh, for him, basically, the Alps are the equivalent of 400 years uh, gone between. Um, so for us these days, wondering, oh, we know what the music looks like. How does this work? Is the same for them as looking at manuscripts or looking at uh, the music of Lully or Corelli in Vienna and saying, how do they do it over there? And so he talks about various aesthetic things, sometimes very specifically and sometimes more generally. Well, maybe one more question. We can... Uh, reflecting on the theme of tonight's concert, um, I can imagine there was a multitude of resources to choose from and a very rich wealth of quality uh, to decide. And I'm curious about what was your thought process and criteria of how you selected the pieces to feature in the program tonight? Partially, it's a, a matter of um, instrumentation, frankly. Um, uh, some, we off, one, of, one of our other members, unfortunately, was not available for this concert, uh, our gamba player, David Morris. Um, with that, as, with him as an element, we actually could have explored uh, things like Francois Couperin, who we know, we know these works, Bach knew them very well. In fact, um, this one piece, L'Imperial, seems, be, uh, seems to have been a gift from Couperin to a violinist, Pissendel, who was a very close colleague of Bach's, and Bach himself quotes it, or one of Bach's students. Um, actually, there's an organ transcription of the piece. So we know it's one of these very direct connections. Speaking of things that are lost, we, there, we also, their story is that there was an extensive correspondence between Bach and Couperin, um, but it turned into jam pot covers. So, oh. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the end of that. Um, but so it was partially instrumentation based. Um, we tried as much as possible to find pieces like the Fuchs or the um, the Rosenmüllers actually in the in the library, uh, isn't there? Yeah. One of the other ones from yeah, that that's right. collection. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because we do have actual records of what was in the Tovaskirche library. So we tried to hew as closely as possible to the scene that we would have known. And as much as much as we talk about the specifics of trying to trying to copy something or trying to have a very strong influence. In the end, this is also about art. It's about making something that works very beautifully. So as much as we talk to the students, oh, this is, uh, this is the style, this is correct, this is incorrect, in the end, it's about expression and it's about um, creating a, an expressive language that, that is as personal for the students um, as it is somehow uh, fitting to the music. And for us coming up with this program, it's a matter of saying, oh, what, what was, either specifically in Bach's library, or what, uh, or what can we do to make a program that is as entertaining and, and moving to, to you in the audience. So, uh, so in the end, there's, there's both, hopefully, both science and art in this. <laughs> and I think that's what we're looking forward to so much. Thank you very, very much, Bob. Uh, <laughs>